It seems like we've lost touch with the art of waiting. I get it. Waiting just sucks. Waiting is hard. But I think waiting reflects something deeper. Something that I hope we haven't lost. Waiting. If you have your Bibles tonight, we're going to be in the book of Romans. The book of Romans in chapter 8. You can follow along on the screen, but if you have your Bibles, there's going to be several times tonight that you might want to mark something in the margin, and so I encourage you to do that. Listen as I read. I'm actually going to be reading from Eugene Peterson's uh, version, a paraphrased version called The Message. I, I, I just happen to believe that this particular, the way it's written, this paraphrase that's in here, I, I believe the way it's written really captures exactly what type of season it is when we say Advent. And so hopefully by the end of tonight, uh, you'll have a good understanding of what this season means. So beginning in verse 22 of Romans 8, it says, all around us, we observe a pregnant creation. The difficult times of pain throughout the world are simply birth pains. But it's not only around us, it's also within us. The Spirit of God is arousing within us. You, we also feel or have these feelings of the birth pains. These sterile and barren bodies of ours are yearning for full deliverance. That is why waiting Waiting does not diminish us in any way, any more than waiting diminishes a pregnant mother. Instead, we are enlarged in the waiting. We are enlarged in the waiting. We, of course, don't say, see what's enlarging us, but the longer we wait, the larger we become, and the more joyful is the expectancy." In this passage, Paul is looking around at the headlines of his day, and he sees pain. He's citing the difficulties. He notices the suffering. And I think too often in our life, when we come to a service, when we go to a Bible study, when we hear a Bible story, when we read Scripture, or even glance at a devotion, we forget how hard life really was 2,000 years ago. In fact, turning your television to one of probably a hundred different channels, and you'll hear how the world today is decaying faster than it ever has before. And that we had better get ready because before long, everything in this world is going to die. But somehow, we have, in the midst of this, forgotten that the morals of the Roman Empire were just as corrupt, if not more, than today. And somehow, we have forgotten that the politics that Paul is living around is just as evil, if not more, than today. Sickness was everywhere because their health care system didn't even have Obamacare like we do today. Regardless of how you feel, it was worse then. We just don't tend to believe that. But somehow, Paul looked at these headlines saw everything that was going on, and saw something very different than what I see today when I read similar headlines. Paul, in fact, is looking around at what's going on in his government, in his people, and he doesn't, in fact, see anything dying. No, instead, he thinks something is pregnant. Which means that he see and he is seeing something that I don't always see when I look around in today's world. 
He absolutely notices that things are unraveling in their life, he, but instead of expecting it to cause mass death, he recognizes that the unraveling of his own government instead is a great opportunity for the gospel to swoop in and to bring life instead of death. So he pins this in his letter, and he says, this is the time not to rebel, but to wait. And that's what Advent really is. It's about waiting. Really, either way you're going to wait, whether it's for something to die or whether it's for something to be born from the pregnancy. But the question or the statement that you need to know today is, it matters how you wait. It matters how you wait. Today, uh, just before I came in and walked through the door, I had uh, I pulled into the parking lot and I had a lady who was driving around the church and she came around and she met me door to door and I get out of the car and she began to tell me that she lost her fiance, her boyfriend, last weekend to a murder. She sat there and watched him die. Maybe some of you recently have lost a loved one. Maybe some of you have watched somebody have to sit in the death pains and begin to die. Maybe you know what it's like to sit resolutely knowing that the end is coming. You're not sure when, but you're sure it's going to come. It's just around the corner. It can happen at any minute. The tone is somber and the mood is low and When you're standing in the room, it really seems like the lights in the room are getting dimmer and darker each minute. Maybe you know what it feels like to look around and feel like something is passing away. But I'm guessing, since most of us are adults, we've also seen the other side of waiting. We're not waiting for something to die, but rather we're waiting for something to be born. And you walked into the hospital after you've gotten that call that says, hey, there's a baby on the way. And we get into the waiting room and there's chatter and there's laughter and there's all kinds of joy. There's an expectation. There's a hope. And you need to know today that that is Advent. You see, Advent is a season of waiting, not of something to end, but waiting for something to be born. Over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about waiting. We're going to talk about what it means to sit and to wait, to live a life where we are expected for something to be born, but yet we have to look around and see death around us. This season, this season of Advent, is just this. I encourage you each week as we do this, take notes, write down, ask questions. My notes are available. They'll be downloadable, download the podcast, look and see, study. And if you don't want to study what I'm saying, pull the scriptures that I'm pulling out and I'm looking at and study them for yourself. Advent is a beautiful, beautiful picture to tell us that we must wait. To begin the series, I want to start with this title, Waiting is hard. Waiting is hard. I don't know if maybe in your life, maybe you're a great waiter. Maybe you're one of these people who can absolutely do it themselves. And you can sit and you don't have a problem at McDonald's when the person in front of you doesn't have correct change. Or maybe you can sit in a line and when the person never has all the price tags on their, their items, it doesn't bother you at all. But for me, that's tough. Waiting's hard. Waiting's hard. In 1970, two psychologists by the name of Walter Michel and Ebby Ebsen, they're in Stanford University, they took kids four and five years old and they put them in a room all by themselves. He would go up to the kid and he'd say, stick in his pocket and he'd say, Johnny, let me tell you something, this is a marshmallow. And I'm gonna give you a marshmallow. It's all yours. You can do whatever you want with that marshmallow. You can eat it. You can save it. You can do whatever you want. But Johnny, if you will leave that marshmallow right there, 
I'm going to leave for 15 minutes. If I come back and you haven't eaten that marshmallow, Johnny, then I'm going to give you another marshmallow, and you can have both of them. Now, I don't know about you, I don't know about you, but telling a kid not to eat a marshmallow for 15 minutes by themselves would be probably the equivalent of going to McDonald's and then telling them telling you that it's going to take two hours for your meal to be brought to you. We'd get upset. So what happened? Well, this is what happened. As soon as the door closed, two out of three of the kids would pick up that marshmallow and just begin eating it. It might have taken them five seconds. It might have taken them 10 seconds. It might have taken them five minutes, 10 minutes. There's one kid that he waited 14 and a half minutes. But then he ate it. But then he ate it. But what was fun to watch wasn't the kids that ate the marshmallow. What was fun to watch was the one out of three that didn't. They would take the marshmallow and they would pick it up and they would smell it. They would lick it. They would pet it like it had fur. I mean, just like they got a new pet. And they would do everything they could. Some of them would stare at that marshmallow as hard as they could and then try to turn around real quick so that Obviously, the marshmallow couldn't look back at them. Some of them would find themselves playing with the clothes just to distract themselves. Well, a little over a decade after this experiment, they followed up with the kids, and let me read to you some of the things that they found. They found that the children that had not eaten the marshmallow were considered more successful They had good grades, they were happy, they had plans. They all had good relationships with their parents, their teachers, and their students. In fact, their parents labeled them fine kids. Here's what is written in the journal. It says, they are rated as more academically and socially competent, more verbally fluent, rational, attentive, planful, and able to deal with frustration and stress. That's huge. I don't know if you realize it. That's huge. In, in a second study in 1990, they went back and they looked at those same kids again. And after they looked at them in 1990, they took and they took the averages over their SAT scores. And the kids that were able to wait on eating the marshmallows scored an average of 250 points higher on their SATs. Massive. In a study in 2011, those same kids were looked at yet again. And when they did a brain scan of the kids, what they found was a higher activity in the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that deals with with forethought and reasoning, and then the ventricle striatum, which is linked to addiction. If you, if you, you have a very strong processing power and strong neural links in that piece of the brain, we see a lesser chance for addiction. And so they were highly active in that study. But what about those who didn't wait. A great percentage of those kids, two out of three kids that didn't wait, a great percentage of those kids that ate the marshmallow early were found to be in trouble in their life. Many did not go to college. Some did not graduate high school. And the vast, vast majority of them had very, very poor grades and poor social relationships. We learned a lot on how important it is to wait. Listen to this scripture out of Matthew 6. I believe it'll follow up on the screen. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do. (laughs) They blow trumpets in the synagogues and the streets, and they call attentions to their acts of charity. I I tell you the truth that they have received all the reward that they will ever get. 
But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Just means keep it quiet. Give your gifts in private, and the Father who sees everything will reward you. One side note that belongs in another sermon is that it says when you give, not if you give to the needy. In this passage, we find a theme that is over and over expressed inside this Sermon on the Mount. In this passage, we find a theme that is actually taught throughout Scripture, and Jesus tends to reiterate the same thing over and over again in his own teachings, that you can have your reward now, or you can have it later. Or you can postpone your reward for now, and you can have a bigger reward later on. But that means you can't have it now. You can grab it for now and lose it later, or you can lose it now and you can have it later. And the truth is, it's a discipline where many of us don't do too well. We want what we want, and we want it right now. I'm reading a book right now called God is in a Manger. It's written by a man by the name of Diedrich Bonhoeffer. And, and, and it's just, it's a set of devotions leading into Advent. And it, it, to say that it has had a, proun, a profound effect on my life would be an understatement. It has really made a difference in my outlook. There's a quote in the book that says this. Listen up to this. Waiting is an art that our impatient age has forgotten. Can I get an amen if I stop right there? Waiting is an art that our impatient age has forgotten. It wants to break open the ripe fruit when it is hardly finished planting the shoot. But all too often, the greedy eyes are only deceived. The fruit that seems so precious is still green inside, and disrespected hands then ungratefully toss it aside. What so has disappointed them. The author Bonhoeffer, you see, was born in 1906 to a fairly well-to-do family, and, and really he could li- left, lived on Easy Street his entire life in relative comfort. He was a brilliant university professor, and, uh, but he pretty much kissed all of that away at the age of 27. You see, at that time, Hitler had just come into power, and he was making divine claims for himself. Bonhoeffer was giving a sermon on the radio, and and inside that sermon, he began to denounce any ruler or country that would ever claim that they are the vehicle of God's work in this world. He said to make such a claim is to make a mockery of God himself. And so they ended up just cutting off his sermon right in the middle, and he never finished it. And within several weeks, he had lost his position at that university. He then spent, as I've read and learned, he has then spent the next 10 years or so traveling around the world, taking small jobs in pastorships and as a theologian in small seminaries. In 1938, he felt God had called him to go back to Germany, and he did it even though it would, he knew it would put his life in danger. There he oversaw this little bitty seminary, And in that time, as a pastor of this little community, he wrote a book or a set of books called Life Together and the Cost of Discipleship. Both excellent, excellent books, by the way. He was working on his book called, uh, master book called Ethics at the time when he was arrested in 1943, and he never finished it. The last two actual years of his life, Bonhoeffer spent in prison. His future was absolutely as bleak as one person's future could get. He was separated from his loved ones and never knew if he would ever see them again. And having no security other than God himself, he wrote, I believe, some of his most profound works. He wrote them in the forms of letters that he sent off to his friends. And then in 1945, only weeks before Hitler and Germany would have to surrender. Hitler made an order that surprised the world and only showed how derived his mind really was. He ordered the execution 
of all the political prisoners and all the descendants. Bonhoeffer and many others were escorted to their death, and he was 39 years old, and he was hung. Yet, here are his recorded last words. This is the end. For me, the beginning of life. The book that I'm reading now, God is in the manger, comes from this season in his life. He, he calls it inside the book when you're reading the edits, he calls this season of his life his own personal advent and his season of waiting. He says at one point, life in a prison cell may very well be compared to that of advent. One waits, one hopes, the door is shut, and it can only be open from the outside. What he's getting at is that we live in a very broken, very incomplete, very painful world, and that we don't have the power to escape any of this on our own. Think about that for a second. All the headlines, all the problems, and though everyone will tell us they have a way out, truth be known, we don't have an escape on our own. What Bonhoeffer is screaming from his letters is the same heartbeat that we read in the New Testament. In fact, it's the same heartbeat of Paul, that there's nothing in this world that's not broken. There's nothing in this world that's not messed up, and there's nothing in this world that will ever complete us. The only thing that complete us is when the final return of Jesus Christ our Lord comes on the scene. Listen to this in the NIV, the same passage of scripture that we read earlier from Romans 8. The NIV records it like this. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in the pains of childbirth right up to this very present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we eagerly wait the adoption to our sonship the redemption of our own bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen, that is no hope at all. For what hopes, for what, who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not have, we then wait for it patiently. Paul tells us that on one hand, we have received the first fruits. We have received the spirit of God. But what you need to know now is that is just a foretaste of what is going to come down the line. Don't think that getting saved is the end of your road. It is only the beginning. Don't think that your plan is just to get you saved in life. God's plan is much bigger than that. God's plan is much, much bigger than that. And we are not to sit here and to appear that we are looking for God in our plan, but rather to seek after our life in his. He's coming back again in this torn up, terrible world. He's coming back again in the middle of all the sickness that we find us, ourselves in. He's coming back again in the middle of a country, a world filled with political turmoil. He's coming back again to stand in the middle of a place that we feel is in moral collapse. His son is coming back again, and he will return more glorious than anything that you can imagine, and he will return in a way that will be better than anything in this world that you can grab and hold on to, his son is coming back, and he's making a difference. When you see this world is falling apart, you need to stop grabbing for more of this or that. You need to stop thinking that anyone or any party can fix this crazy world. Know that it will never happen. You need to stop listening to a world solution. We're not waiting for them to solve it. We're looking for the one person who can only solve it. The only thing that's going to fix this insane merry-go-round of a world is exactly what the true church is waiting on. It's what we're waiting on, and it is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the true answer. At this point, I am wanting to stand at this pulpit and scream with everything in me, stop and don't eat the marshmallows for today. 
stop looking for the now, stop looking for what feels good now, stop looking for the easy solution, and finally tune in to what can finally solve these problems, and that is turning to Jesus Christ. Bonhoeffer wrote in 1943 that we have lost the art of waiting. If that was true back then, then I believe today is a hundred times or a thousand times worse. We live in a culture today that tells us to wait for absolutely nothing. To, to, we live in a culture today that tells us that we need to run from pain. We need to look for something better. We need to get our best life now. Meanwhile, the gospel is screaming out at the top of its lung, no, a bigger reward will come when you wait. And we, when will we say that I don't want my la- best life? now. I want my best life then. And that is contrary to what message is being taught across the world. We are conditioned to change anything we don't like in this world. We don't like a store, push a button, grab you a new store, go to amazon.com or whatever it is. You don't like your car, push a button and get you a self a new car. You don't like the clothes you're wearing, push a button and go get you some new clothes. You don't like your, your, your TV set, well then go get your, a new TV set. You don't like the worship of the church you're sitting in, then push a button and find yourself a new church. You don't like two sermons in a row at a church, well push a button and get yourself a new preacher. Let me tell you something, we don't want our marshmallows, but we want bigger marshmallows than we can ever say. We want more marshmallows, we want fluffier marshmallows, We're on a merry-go-round that's telling us to seek after tastier marshmallows. And truth be known, we're addicted to this of getting exactly what we want. We keep chasing this world for trivial things for the here and now, and we keep running from pain. We're running from solitude. We're running from silence, and we're running from waiting. And yet the gospel itself is screaming at the top of its lungs, to just stop. Aren't you tired yet? Stop following the world's ideas. And Advent tells us we need to learn to wait. Just like those same kids that we saw, I wonder when we'll realize in our life that the real reward will come when we decide to learn to wait. Thank you so very much for joining us here today at Church in the Rock. If this is your first time, let me encourage you to go to JesusTheRock.org. There you can find out any information on us, look at our latest podcast or our blogs. If you would like to give to our ministries financially, you can easily do so by clicking on the giving button at the top right-hand corner of the screen on our website. Have a blessed day.